Imagine, you've waited nine months, and the magical day is finally here. Your son is about to be born. The doctors and nurses gather round. Don't push yet. Don't push yet. Okay, now push. Push. Here he comes. Oh my goodness, is that his head? Looks like a kiwi. So much blood. Everything is so slippery. How do these people manage to hold on to tiny little babies covered in goo? Okay, he's out now. They put him on a table to clean him up. This is when they're supposed to let Dad cut the cord, but they don't this time. You can't really tell what's going on because of the growing crowd of doctors and nurses surrounding that little table. You see a doctor slap your son on the leg. A few seconds later, he slaps him harder, then harder. Why is he slapping your son so hard? Is this guy trying to get his teeth knocked out? Now, if you're anything like me, the sound of a baby crying is pretty much the most annoying sound in the universe. But all of a sudden, you realize that there's a much, much worse sound than a baby crying. And that's the sound of silence when your baby should be crying. Then you notice one of the nurses using an ambu bag to pump breaths into your baby. Is he dead? They don't tell you. They're too busy rushing him out of the room. And by that point, trust me on this, you would give anything you have. You would give your right arm. You would give your life just to hear your baby cry. But all you get is silence. So that's what happened in November of 2007 when our third son, Reed, was born. He was what they call a floppy baby. He had a heartbeat, but apart from that, he wasn't crying or breathing or moving. Most of his muscles weren't working. There are lots of different problems that can cause floppy baby syndrome. If a baby's muscles aren't functioning, that can be due to a problem in the brain, a problem in the nerves, or a problem in the muscles themselves. So doctors start running tests to figure out what's wrong. It took a couple of months to get a diagnosis. A lab eventually discovered that Reed had X-linked myotubular myopathy, MTM for short, which is a rare genetic muscle disease. MTM usually only affects boys because it's X-linked. It's a problem with the X chromosome. Girls have two X chromosomes, so even if they get a bad one, the good one compensates. Boys have one X chromosome, so they inherit either the good one or the bad one, which means that if the mother is a carrier, any sons born to her will have a 50-50 chance of getting the disease. Boys who get the disease will have extremely weak muscles. In recent years, medical researchers managed to cure the disease in mice and then in dogs, so all of the families of kids with MTM were looking forward to a cure. The cure seemed like it was right around the corner. But when doctors began human trials, there were side effects, namely liver failure. Kids whose muscles were being repaired started dying of liver failure. So researchers had to go back to the drawing board, and a cure is going to take longer than we hoped. This past April, my wife Marie was taking Reed to watch a play. He was happy and laughing. Then an alarm on his monitor went off. His oxygen level started dropping. Marie and the nurse went into emergency mode. We've been there plenty of times before. Reed's heart rate shot up, then his heart stopped. Marie and soon paramedics tried to revive him, but he didn't make it. The next day, I posted this on Twitter. In 2007, our third son was born but he wasn't moving or breathing. Once the doctors figured out what disease he had, they told us he had a 50% chance of reaching his first birthday and a 30% chance of reaching his second birthday. Yesterday, around 4 o'clock p.m., Reed went to be with Jesus. And on the picture I put, Reed Wood, 2007 to 2023, and on to eternity. The comments from Christians, Muslims, atheists, Hindus, and so on were overwhelmingly kind. Even people who ordinarily hate me said they didn't have any ill will toward my son. But this is the internet we're talking about. So you know it's not going to be all prayers and condolences. You know there are going to be some adherents of a particular religious persuasion who are going to seize this opportunity to say something unpleasant. You know who I'm talking about. Atheists. To be fair, I did get some unfriendly messages from keyboard jihadis who said things like, Your censored son right now. 
I'm not up to date on what words are politically incorrect, but I think I'm not supposed to say the R word. So that's supposedly my son Reed in hell. Your son Reed is now dirt, lol. You will never touch his hands again. You will never look at his face smiling to you. Reed is worm food now. Lol, good riddance on your son. It was a good day when your censored son died. Hopefully the next one will follow, censored. This guy photoshopped a pig's face over my son's face. What's with the French kiss, creep? Kissing on lips, pedo would. Alhamdulillah, he is gone for better life than staying with a pedo dad. Notice there's no real content in these comments. It's just keyboard jihadis trying to figure out how to hurt my feelings. Good luck with that one. You know what's weird? There's something kind of adorable about these guys spending the past 15 years searching for some secret formula to make me sad. It's like toddlers trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. They actually remind me of when I was a little kid. There was a railroad track behind our trailer park and a coal train went by every day. I spent years trying to derail that train. I pried up hundreds of railroad spikes that held the tracks in place. I covered the tracks with rocks and whatever else I could find. Nothing ever affected the train. I'd be there for hours piling stuff on the tracks and the train would just plow right through it. You keyboard jihadis are like kids trying to derail a coal train. And I'm the coal train. Choo choo, buckaroos. But by all means, keep trying. People keep searching for Blackbeard's treasure. Why shouldn't you keep searching for D. Wood's feelings? And just think, if you succeed, you'll be rich. Because if you can come up with a way to get tears from these ice marbles, you'll have no problem striking oil in a bowl of oatmeal or gathering a jar of honey from a slab of granite or collecting a barrel of moonshine from the moon. Keep shining, superstars. Caddy comments from atheists are different because there's usually some sort of moral condemnation involved. It's not just, ha ha, your son died. It's, David, you're evil because X, Y, Z. For instance, in response to my tweet about my son's death, one atheist replied, Disgusting. Only a Christian could use the death of a child to promote their religion. I wouldn't have said anything if you hadn't, but seriously? Gone to be with Jesus? I could never bring myself to worship he who can't even give my child a working body. So, Christians need to keep our mouths shut about our beliefs when a child dies. If we don't keep our mouths shut, then our behavior is disgusting. There's also a version of what's called the problem of evil, or the argument from evil here. How can you worship a god who let your kid have a muscle disease? Quite refreshing! Unlike the keyboard jihadis, this guy's actually presenting meaningful criticisms so that he can help make the world a better place. A place where people with religious beliefs do not mention those beliefs when their children die. This is, of course, only one random atheist, so why even draw attention to, hey, wait a minute, 19 likes? Seriously, atheists? Then we have... Normies genuinely believe forcing a body to live past the neonatal period when it wasn't meant to is empathetic, utterly sociopathic behavior. I think this is the first time in my life I've ever been called a normie. Not the first time I've been accused of sociopathic behavior. I don't think this is even coherent. A normie is a normal person. Sociopathic behavior, pretty much by definition, is not normal. In a follow-up comment about Reed, we have, With his mental and physical capacity being a little more than a chair, I wouldn't exactly say he enjoyed anything. The idea here is that if someone doesn't enjoy life, his life isn't worth living, so he's better off dead. Now, I don't know what chairs are like where this person lives, but I've never seen a chair do the reedy dance. I'm starting to think that in spite of having a debilitating muscle disease, 
Reed enjoyed life more than a lot of people who spend their time complaining on Twitter. But what do you think about the idea that if someone is born with a serious disability, you should let him die? You could make an argument for that position. You could say, well, ordinarily, in the animal kingdom, an offspring with some sort of significant mental or physical defect is going to die very quickly, but because human beings are smarter and more advanced, we can take a baby that wouldn't survive 15 minutes and extend his life by 15 years. Just because we can extend life, however, doesn't mean that we should. Parents have an instinct to protect their children, and that instinct doesn't automatically turn off if a child has a disability. But that's where reason comes in. We can use our reason to say, even though I feel like I should protect my disabled child, maybe it's better to just let him go. Why put a child through a difficult life? Why use society's already limited resources to extend the life of someone who doesn't seem fit to survive? Something like that, right? Of course, once you decide that a baby with significant special needs shouldn't live, the next question is, since you've chosen to go down mass murder road, or mercy killing road, depending on your view, how far are you willing to go? One of Reed's four brothers has the same muscle disease. He's 13 years old. It's a lot of work taking care of him. Should we pull the plug on his breathing machine? Let's ignore the normies for a moment. Suppose we decide to make tough choices for the greater good, and we put together a list of people who aren't fit to survive, or who are a drain on resources. What sort of people will be on our death list? People with physical disabilities? Mental disabilities? People with various diseases? What about old people? They're not contributing much once they've retired. We could turn them into food, like in Silent Green. That was a spoiler, but the movie's like 50 years old, so stop whining or I'll add whiners to our death list. What about stupid people? Should they be removed from the gene pool? We don't want to end up with an idiocracy, do we? What if someone is just chronically unhappy, always miserable and depressed? Criminals? Poor people? Everyone we disagree with? There is no mix-up. Eugenics can't fix up. Am I right? This may sound ridiculous to you, especially if you're a normie, but the world may already be heading in that direction, and it's not exactly a new idea. There's a short passage in The White Rose that's relevant here. The White Rose is a book about a resistance movement in Nazi Germany. Five students and a professor distributed a series of leaflets encouraging Germans to oppose the genocidal regime. The students and the professor were caught and executed. Inga Scholl, who was the sister of two of the students, Hans and Sophie, eventually wrote a book about the movement and the events that led to their resistance. I had to read Die Weisse Rosa in German back in college. Here's the relevant passage. Now and again, nurses from Schwäbisch Hall, former friends of her mother's, Sophie Scholl's mother, came to visit. In that city, there was a large hospital for mentally ill children. One day, one of the nurses called. She was despondent and distraught, and we did not know how to help her. Finally, she told us the reason for her grief. For some time past, her wards had been carted off by the black vans of the SS and sent to their death in gas chambers. After the first contingents failed to return from their secret journey, a strange disturbance agitated the children in the institution. Where are the trucks going, auntie? They are going to heaven, replied the nurses in their helplessness and confusion. From that time on, the children mounted the strange trucks singing. A physician in one of the mental hospitals protested over my dead body. It is not known what became of him. A soldier came home from Russia on furlough. He was the father of one of these children. He had never ceased hoping that his child would be cured. He felt toward his son the love that only a father can feel. But when he arrived, the child was already dead. So this soldier was out fighting for the Nazi regime. He came home and went to see his son, but the party he was fighting for had already sent his son to a gas chamber without even bothering to notify him. By the way, it's a little ambiguous here, but the black trucks didn't take children to gas chambers. The black trucks were mobile 
gas chambers. They were called Gaswagen. The Nazis would load kids into the trucks, drive the kids to a mass grave, and gas them along the way. So the kids would already be dead by the time they got to the mass grave, where their bodies would be dumped. One problem the Nazis struggled to solve was soundproofing the trucks. The children would start screaming once they realized they were dying, and some drivers would be bothered by the sounds of mentally ill kids being executed a few feet behind them. The nurses couldn't do anything to stop this, so they would tell the children that the trucks were taking them to heaven, and the children would climb into the trucks singing songs until they realized they were dying. I can only imagine one of our enlightened Twitter atheists scolding the nurses for bringing religion into the discussion. So, the idea that society should get rid of special needs children is nothing new, and people complaining about my wife and me taking care of special needs children is nothing new. I've been getting these messages for years. The best ones typically use the machine gun approach. They'll fire a bunch of different points at me all at once. Here's an example of the machine gun approach. This is before Reed died. Jordan says, Hi, David. I started listening to a Your Why I'm a Christian video. I'll put a link to that video in the description box in case you want to understand what he's talking about. And became convinced after about eight minutes that you are censored. Again, I don't think I'm supposed to say the R word. And insane. I also could not believe that your wife rolled the censored dice and basically purposely brought a... Am I allowed to say this G word? I only knew the word from Pulp Fiction and from some perverted messages that Muhammad Hijab sent to the apostate prophet in me, and in both cases it had something to do with bondage, so I didn't know what Jordan was talking about here. But I looked it up, and it's also a derogatory term for a person with a disability. Anyhow, I'll play it safe. I also could not believe that your wife rolled the censored dice and basically purposely brought a censored into the world who will be cruelly and inhumanly condemned to a miserable existence, because apparently she is as censored and insane as you are. I mean, how evil do you two censored have to be to do that? It blows my censored mind, which got me thinking, it's probably a good thing that your brother fried his censored brains. At this point, the whole family is suspect. Anyway, have a happy new year, you autistic piece of censored. Speaking of death lists, According to Jordan, my whole family should apparently be loaded into a gas wagon and taken to a mass grave. I'm sure there are plenty of keyboard jihadis who would agree with him. And speaking of my whole family, it's kind of weird that these guys always seem to know an awful lot about my wife, my kids, my brothers. They know everything about me. I wonder if some of these super fans have little D. Wood shrines on their dressers. Jordan mentions my brother Manny, who suffered some brain damage because of an overdose a few years ago. Manny had massive organ failure and went into a coma. While he was in a coma, our mom died of an overdose. Not sure why Jordan left my mom's death out of his email. Rookie mistake, Jordan. Unless this suggests some underlying mother issues. Put that one in the vault and save it for later. Doctors didn't expect my brother Manny to survive, but he did. He came out of his coma. He had to relearn how to walk and how to talk. He stayed clean for three and a half years. Then recently, he injured his foot, and he went to a doctor who, unbeknownst to us, prescribed Manny opioid painkillers. Manny got hooked again, and I'm sure Jordan will be happy to hear that my brother Manny died of an overdose three weeks ago. So, Jordan... And scratch Manny off your list. Jordan says that my wife rolled the dice and basically purposely brought a special needs child into the world. No idea what he means by purposely. We didn't intend for Reed to have MTM. I think Jordan might be referring to our fourth son, Paley, who also has MTM, but we didn't intend that either. After we found out that Reed's disease was genetic, we tried not to get pregnant again. But it turns out that nearly all forms of birth control are completely useless when the fortress is being stormed by what can only be described as the Delta Force piranha of tadpoles. I can't miss even when I try. So, Marie got pregnant. Again, ultrasound showed that it was another boy, which meant there was a 50-50 chance that he would have MTM. That's probably why Jordan said we were rolling the dice. 
Apparently Jordan thinks we should have had an abortion based on the 50-50 chance. And the doctor did bring that up as an option, to which Marie replied, Yes, my son has a 50% chance of having MTM, but he has a 100% chance of being loved. I thought that was a really cool thing to say, but according to Jordan's perfectly functioning moral compass, that was one of the most evil things ever said by anyone. So evil, in fact, that my entire family line is a danger to humanity, except for my mother, who is suspiciously absent from Jordan's email. One of the underlying moral principles for Jordan is that quality of life is more important than life. Quality of life trumps life. If someone is going to have a low quality of life, he's better off not living. Now, you can make that case in certain instances. Suppose someone is in constant agonizing pain with no hope and nothing to look forward to and wants to die. What do you do? I get that. But what if you're pregnant and your son has a 50-50 chance of having a disease that will leave him with really, really weak muscles and the disease is somewhat close to being cured? According to our new friend Jordan, if you don't abort that baby, you're so undeniably evil that the world would be a better place without your entire family line. What if you have the baby anyway and he has MTM? According to another new friend, if you take care of him after he's born, you're a normie who behaves like a sociopath. What if you're a normie who behaves like a sociopath, so you take care of your son for 15 years and then he dies? Well, whatever you do, don't so much as mention any of your religious beliefs, because if you do, you might provoke the wrong atheist, who will be all too happy to remind you that you shouldn't worship God if he doesn't give your son properly functioning muscles. See how I assembled a full range of criticisms to absolutely bury myself in a coffin made of pure fear under six feet of airtight atheist reasoning? Let's see if I can Houdini myself out of this one. Okay, now that we're clear on what the criticisms are, I'm going to answer them. But David, why are you going to answer people who are saying all these mean things? Oh, there's a reason. There's a reason. But there's a pretty significant black hole-ish space-time bending obstacle here because I'll be responding to people whose view of the world warps reality as I know it. They see the universe very, very differently from the way I see it. Their view of good, bad, right, wrong, moral obligation, and so on is radically opposed to my own, even on matters that involve the life and death of a baby. They haven't offered any foundation or justification for their claims, so the claims are just floating in the air like bubbles waiting to be popped. But if I simply say the opposite of what they say, without any foundation or justification, then it's all just words, words to be led out to battle against other words, as Lewis once said. So I'm inclined to give some kind of framework to my views to show how it's all connected. Our new friends may say, but David, why should we listen to you? you heartless evil monster who takes care of special needs kids and also posts tweets about his beliefs? Well, you guys messaged me. You messaged me. Am I allowed to respond? Or is anyone who answers you evil and immoral? I carefully considered your claims, didn't I? How about carefully considering mine, so that at the very least, you'll understand why we see things so differently? Fair is fair, isn't it? Now, we could go into ethics and meta-ethics, but that might get boring and technical, and I want to keep things as simple as possible for our new Twitter friends. So, I'm just going to share a story. Since we're partly analyzing Christianity here, I'll share a story from the Bible. And since we're talking about the ethics of killing my son, let's go through the story of God commanding Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Atheists already love going to this story. They say, look at how wicked God is, ordering Abraham to kill his own son. Which is ironic, considering the messages they send me, telling me I'm wicked for not killing my own son. So, let's go through the story of Abraham and Isaac, but let's do something that our atheist friends almost never do. Let's try to understand it. Here goes. In the ancient world, your love for your God was measured by the value of the sacrifice you brought to the altar. The greater the value of your sacrifice, the greater your devotion to your God. Hence, in the land of Canaan, followers of the god Moloch believed that a man's ultimate act of piety was sacrificing his own child to Moloch. 
the priests would heat up a bronze statue of the pagan god until it was glowing. The devout would place their children into its fiery arms, and the children would burn. Then came Abraham. One of the most famous stories in the Old Testament, indeed one of the most famous stories in the world, is the story of God commanding Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham was so faithful to God that he was ready to obey God's command to sacrifice what was, to Abraham, the most precious thing in the world, his son Isaac. He loved God so much that he tied up his son, put him on a pile of wood, and was about to plunge a knife into him. Critics of the Bible look at this and say, God told Abraham to sacrifice his own son? And Abraham was going to obey him? How barbaric! What an evil book! The God of the Bible is a monster! And so was Abraham for obeying him. But, as usual, the critics completely miss the point. And they're not simply missing some insignificant random point here, they're missing what may be the most amazing, life-changing, mind-blowing point that's ever been made in the history of forever. And I challenge every last one of you, Christian, atheist, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, whatever you may be, I challenge you to read through this with me until you get the point and then find any story by anyone ever that's this deep, this profound, this powerful, this epic. Challenge accepted? Good. Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham... Here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Abraham, of course, had another son, Ishmael, but Ishmael had been cast out in Genesis 21, leaving Abraham with Isaac as his only son and as his heir. God tells Abraham to take Isaac to the region of Moriah, which is the region of Jerusalem. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Notice that Isaac had to carry the wood on which he was to be sacrificed, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham obviously hadn't told anyone what he was about to do. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Interesting. Abraham, a prophet, says that God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Who told Abraham to stop the sacrifice? The angel of the Lord. There are lots of angels in the Bible. The word angel simply means messenger. But this particular messenger, called the angel of the Lord here, is no ordinary angel. He's a messenger who speaks for God, but who is also identified as God. Even here in Genesis 22, the angel of the Lord speaks as God. He says, you have not withheld from me your son. So according to the angel of the Lord, Abraham was offering a sacrifice to him, to the angel of the Lord. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. 
Abraham told Isaac that God himself would provide a lamb for the sacrifice. But God provided a ram. Where's the lamb? What about the lamb? Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. Where were they? The region of Moriah. Mount Moriah, just so you know, is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. As we read in 2 Chronicles 3, Then Solomon began to build the Temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. So, there's a specific mountain, Mount Moriah, and there's the region of Moriah. Abraham was somewhere in the area of Jerusalem. God showed him a specific place. God provided his own sacrifice. And for many centuries, Abraham's descendants would say, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. The angel of the Lord declares, I swear by myself, I will surely bless you, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore, your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will will be blessed because you have obeyed me. That is quite the promise. Thousands of years before any of us had ever heard about any of this, the angel of the Lord told some completely unknown guy who lived in the middle of nowhere that all nations on earth would be blessed through his offspring. But Abraham was ready to sacrifice his offspring, his son Isaac, when God told him to. Keep in mind, Isaac was no ordinary son. He was the son of promise. Years earlier, Abraham had complained that even though God had blessed him abundantly, God hadn't blessed him with a son to be his heir. And Abraham knew that it was already too late, because he and his wife were way, way, way past their prime, to put it mildly. But God told him in Genesis 15 that he would indeed have a son, and that his descendants would be like the stars in the sky. By the way, this passage is where we see what made Abraham unique among his contemporaries. Abraham wasn't unique because he was willing to sacrifice his son. There were pagans who were willing to do that. Abraham was unique because God kept making promises to him that sounded increasingly unbelievable, but Abraham kept believing that God was going to do what he promised. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. In Genesis 17, God told him that the son of promise would be born to Sarah, who would be the mother of nations. God would establish an everlasting covenant through Isaac. So, when God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son, this was a very special son. This son was prophesied. This son would have a miraculous birth. The everlasting covenant would come through this son. And then God said, Remember all that stuff I said about your son? Remember all the promises I made about him? You know how all of your hopes and dreams are riding on this one particular son? Now I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Abraham's gods suddenly started sounding just like the gods of the pagans. Sacrifice your child to me. We look at this as people in the 21st century. We look at this as people who came long after the complete reversal of paganism that was about to take place. But try to think about this from the perspective of the people around Abraham. Abraham was surrounded by people who were convinced that the greatest thing they could ever do was sacrifice their children to their God. Abraham was ready to do it, but the angel of the Lord told him to stop. The takeaway message of the story of Abraham and Isaac for the surrounding culture was this. Abraham is just as devout as the most devout of any of you. He's the sort of person who's willing to do whatever his God commands. He loves his God so much that he's ready to sacrifice what he values most in this world. 
The difference between you and Abraham is not that Abraham is willing to sacrifice his son. Some of you are willing to do that too. The difference between you and Abraham is that Abraham's God doesn't want him to sacrifice his son. Abraham's God stops him from sacrificing his son. Abraham's God provides his own sacrifice. So, putting all of this together... God, who's no ordinary God, orders his prophet, who's no ordinary prophet, to sacrifice his son, who's no ordinary son, but the sacrifice is stopped by an angel, who's no ordinary angel. End of story, right? Wrong. The story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this story isn't finished because there was something about a lamb and an everlasting covenant and all nations being blessed through Abraham's offspring. You didn't forget about that, did you? Not going too fast for you, am I, atheists? So, how was God going to bless all nations through Abraham's offspring? Well, we start getting some hints through the prophets. In Isaiah 53, we find a prophecy about someone who would be punished for the sins of others. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The passage even says that he would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. But then we get some puzzling details. For instance, in Zechariah 12, God says, They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. This is God speaking, and God says that people will look at him after piercing him. How does someone pierce God and look at him? And then, oddly enough, after God says, They will look on me, He switches to the third person and refers to the one who's pierced as him, as if there's some sort of distinction between God and the one who's pierced. I'm getting confused. We read about the angel of the Lord, who's somehow the Lord, even though he's distinct from the Lord. There's the one who was pierced, who's somehow God and distinct from God. Is there anyone who can clear this up for us? Let's check the Gospel of John, starting at the very first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word was God, but was also with God. That reminds me of the angel of the Lord, the messenger who spoke for God, but was also God. And in case you're wondering, yes, the angel of the Lord was the pre-incarnate Jesus. He was the eternal word who was with God and who was God. But he entered creation as Jesus of Nazareth via the incarnation because how else would they pierce God? Verse 14, And the word, who was God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here, the distinction between the Lord and the angel of the Lord, the distinction between God and the Word of God, is the distinction between the Father and the Son. John the Baptist started preaching before Jesus, but when John saw Jesus approaching, he said in verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Is this the Lamb we've been waiting for? John also said in the same passage, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, remained on Jesus. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John is referring to Jesus' baptism, which we read about in Matthew 3. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. 
And behold, the heavens were opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The voice is the voice of God the Father. Notice that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit together identify Jesus as the Divine Son, which is how John knew who Jesus really was. John the Baptist identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. John identified Jesus as the Son of God because that's what God the Father and God the Holy Spirit revealed to him. You're not going to reject the witness of John the Baptist, are you Muslims? A little later in the Gospel of John, in chapter 3, Jesus is having a discussion with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Since Nicodemus had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, Jesus asks him, How do you not understand what's going on here? And then we get the most famous verse of any book in history, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This verse is famous in its own right, but I don't think you get the full impact unless you read it in light of the greater biblical context. Again, among the pagans, your love for your God was measured by the value of your sacrifice. The most precious thing you could ever have would be your children, especially if you only had one child, and especially if that child was your heir. So, the greatest thing you could do was sacrifice your only son to your God. That's how you would demonstrate your love for your God. God ordered Abraham to sacrifice his son, a very special son, a son like no other, the son of promise. Then the angel of the Lord, a.k.a. the Word, a.k.a. the eternal divine son, a.k.a. the pre-incarnate Christ, stopped Abraham because God provides his own sacrifice. God would provide a lamb. Then God provided a ram. What about the lamb? Well, the lamb turns out to be the angel of the Lord, the Word, the Divine Son, the pre-incarnate Christ. So, when Abraham said that God would provide a lamb, the lamb that God would provide was there. The lamb, a.k.a. the angel of the Lord, a.k.a. the Word, a.k.a. the Son, a.k.a. the pre-incarnate Christ, was the one who told Abraham to shut down the sacrifice of Isaac. The Son... The Word, the angel of the Lord, enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth, and this is definitely no ordinary Son. This is the eternal divine Son, who, because of his incarnation, is also the Son of Abraham, the Son of Isaac, the Son of Jacob, the Son of David. He's the Messiah. He's the one through whom all nations of the world would be blessed. He's the one through whom the world would be saved. Jesus is the ultimate son of promise. Everything, all the promises, the entire world is riding on this son of promise. This is the most important son ever. And we mocked him, spit on him, hit him, lashed him to a gory mess, and nailed him to a cross. Ironically, some of the descendants of Abraham united with the pagans to have him crucified. Let that sink in. Abraham was willing to kill Isaac, just like the most devout pagans were willing to kill their sons. Abraham sacrificed the ram that the angel of the Lord provided as a substitute for Isaac. Then, when the ultimate son of promise appeared, descendants of Abraham and descendants of pagans worked together to execute him. Where? In the region of Moriah. Like Isaac before him, Jesus didn't fight back. In John 19, we have the complaints of the Jewish leaders. We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. The Romans didn't care much about this, but they did have a problem with someone claiming to be king. Claiming to be king would put you at odds with Caesar. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross. Remember Isaac carrying the wood for the fire? to the place called the Place of a Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Calling a crucified man the King of the Jews was simultaneously an insult to the Jewish leaders, hey, I know you hate this guy, so I'm calling him your king, and a standard Roman warning to anyone thinking about challenging Caesar. The irony is that it was true. Jesus is the king of the Jews and the king of everyone else. But we nailed him to a cross and he died. And then we read, For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. Remember Zechariah 12, where God says, They will look on me, the one they have pierced. Jesus' followers picked up on that too. In fact, they picked up on a lot of things. In Acts 3, Peter heals a lame beggar in the name of Jesus, and that gives him the opportunity to share some of his newfound knowledge. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Peter calls Jesus the author of life, which would be God, but God raised him from the dead. There's that recurring distinction between God and a servant who's also God. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. God did what he said he was going to do, and he did it through you. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Funny, my Muslim friends insist that the verses Peter quotes here are about Muhammad. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Peter brings it back to the story of Abraham and Isaac when the angel of the Lord promised Abraham that all nations would be blessed through his offspring. Peter points out that God sent his servant Jesus, a.k.a. the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, a.k.a. the angel of the Lord, a.k.a. the word of God, a.k.a. the Son of God, to the Jews first. Later in Acts, we see how the gospel spread to the Gentiles as well, so that all nations would be blessed through Jesus. But there's also this part about God raising Jesus from the dead. Interestingly, that was part of the story about Abraham and Isaac too. We read in Hebrews 11, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. When we went through Genesis 22, we saw that 
As Abraham was about to go sacrifice Isaac, he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. We, both of us, will come back to you. Why did Abraham say that Isaac would return when Isaac was about to be sacrificed? Well, according to Hebrews, Abraham reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. In other words, Abraham had two pieces of information to go on. One, God said that Abraham's descendants would be like the stars and that the covenant would be through Isaac. Two, God ordered Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham believed God and did the math. If Isaac's about to die, and I'm going to have a ton of descendants through Isaac, then God is going to raise him from the dead. Think about how this sets the stage for the Messiah. There are prophecies about the Messiah being the blessing to all nations and ruling the world. There are also prophecies about the Messiah claiming that he would suffer and die. How do we make sense of this? Well, we could say it makes no sense for the Messiah to die and rule the world, so these prophecies must be talking about different people. That's one way to make sense of the conflicting messages from the prophets. But if you think like Abraham, how would you reconcile the conflicting messages? You'd say, if God tells us that the Messiah is going to suffer and die, and that all nations are going to be blessed through the Messiah and his reign, then God is going to raise the Messiah from the dead. That's what you would expect if you were going to apply Abrahamic thinking to Messianic prophecies, and it's exactly what happened. Now, as this story unfolded, did you catch the complete, total reversal of ancient paganism? The ancient pagans said, sacrifice your son to show your love for your God. The God of the Bible says, not how this works, shut it down. You don't offer your son to show your love for me. I offer my son to show my love for you. It's no longer, for Abraham so loved God that he gave his only son. It's, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God judo flips the pagan script. He turns the entire system upside down. No more sacrificing your way to God. God sacrifices his way to you. And he brings his own sacrifice. You can see this all the way from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, because it was the plan all along. Revelation 13.8 All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. The Lamb was slain from the creation of the world. But notice what else this prophecy says. Everyone whose name hasn't been written in the Lamb's book of life will worship the beast. If you reject the reversal of paganism through the gospel, you go right back to paganism. Here you may be thinking, Nonsense, David. Society has evolved beyond paganism. We don't need this God and this lamb and this gospel to tell us not to sacrifice our children. Oh, I think someone does. Have you heard of the grooming gangs in the UK? Thousands and thousands of little girls were groomed, raped, and pimped for decades. Police, social workers, prosecutors, they knew exactly what was happening, and they let it happen because they didn't want to be called Islamophobes for exposing the Pakistani Muslims who were devouring these young girls. What were the enlightened new pagans of Great Britain doing? They were sacrificing their daughters to their new god. What about the U.S.? When parents decide that it's a good idea to have their confused children dismembered, put on an operating table as part of an ongoing Mengele-like medical experiment, are the parents really doing what's best for their kids, or are they showing their devotion to their new God? What about the unborn? If you go back just 20 or 30 years, the pro-choice crowd said they wanted abortion to be safe, legal, and rare. 
They wanted it to be rare. It wasn't something to be happy about. Now people have abortion parties. There are abortion celebrations. Women wear I had an abortion t-shirts. It's one thing to have an abortion. It's something else entirely to celebrate and brag about it. Why would a woman celebrate killing her offspring? Because it demonstrates her devotion to her new God. Have human beings really moved past their pagan inclinations? Or, as we turn away from the lamb God provided, are we entering a new golden age of pagan worship? You can let me know your answer right after Drag Queen Story Hour. Fasten your seatbelts, kids, because reality is a hard wall to crash into. So, that's the story of Abraham and Isaac. What's it got to do with me and my son Reed? Well, when you read a story like the story of Abraham and Isaac, and you really try to understand it, and you see that it's part of a bigger story, and you see how this bigger story unfolds over thousands of years, and you see how everything is connected to everything else, you start to see that we're part of the story as well. This isn't a random story sitting on a bookshelf that you pick up and read and then put back on the shelf. We're in this one. You, me, the strong, the weak, the healthy, the sick, the lovers, the haters, even our Muslim friends who say, no, the story of Abraham and Isaac is actually about Abraham and Ishmael, which completely destroys the meaning because that's just what heresies do. Whoever you are, you're in this story with me. And not only are we part of the same story, we're writing the story. You get to help write your own part in the story. We're writing our parts right now. You can be the hero, you can be the villain. You can be the champion of good ideas, you can be the champion of bad ideas. You can be the friend of the fatherless, the defender of the downtrodden, the enemy of oppressors. Or you can be the emotional equivalent of a toddler throwing a tantrum on the floor of the checkout aisle at Walmart because mommy wouldn't buy him a pack of Starbursts. We're in this story together and we're writing it together. If you understand the plot, you start to see events, good and bad, from an eternal perspective, where the value of people or things isn't limited to how much pleasure or comfort they bring you at some given moment. Modern atheism is a bunch of people trying to take themselves out of the story that we're all in. It's like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern trying to take themselves out of Hamlet. But when you try to take yourself out of this story, and you lose the main plot, all you're left with is whatever's in front of you and how it makes you feel. Imagine someone picking up a thousand page novel that you've never read, going to page 487, cutting out two sentences from that page and just giving you those two sentences to go on. He gives you two sentences from page 487 of this thousand page novel and then he tells you to figure out what's going on. Will you have any clue what's going on in that book? No. You'll take those two sentences and fill in the rest of the plot with your own feelings and fantasies, particularly the feelings and fantasies that are fashionable in whatever group you happen to be in. And any plot that you somehow manage to weld together will bear almost no resemblance to the plot of the actual novel. What I find utterly amazing about our new atheist friends, and I'm talking about the perpetually angry and hostile ones here, is that once they put all their feelings and fantasies and fashions and fads together into some confused, disjointed, silly, boring Frankenstein monster of an ideology, they'll jump on Twitter and throw that mess in my face like I'm supposed to live according to their incoherent nonsense. Here, David, try a slice of our uncooked peanut butter, pineapple, and pickle pizza served in a dirty ashtray with a side order of rat droppings and a tall glass of fermented depression. How about no? The moral obligations they try to impose make no sense according to their own worldview. So why do they try to impose them on others? I'll tell you why. Augustine said to God, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. 
Our atheist friends have restless hearts. They always find something to cling to, like a security blanket. They don't cling to something that's evil. They cling to something that's good or true, but which has been removed from its proper place and disconnected from more important things. Chesterton said, A fad or heresy is the exaltation of something which, even if true, is secondary or temporary in its nature against those things which are essential and eternal, those things which always prove themselves true in the long run. So, for example, sex is good. Until you build your entire life around it and you disconnect it from things like love and faithfulness and you strip away its meaning. Tolerance is good. Until you exalt it above wisdom and justice and truth and common sense and you start despising people who don't disconnect it from other things that are good. Avoiding needless pain is good. Until you start telling people to kill babies who have weak muscles. Atheists are constantly latching on to something, even to something good, like a particular virtue, but it's always something that's secondary or temporary, as opposed to things that are essential and eternal. So, we try to tell them that even though what they're latching onto may be good, it'll never be enough. But they don't get it. It's like trying to explain to a baby that he's not going to fill his belly by sucking his thumb. The baby won't understand your explanation because he's a baby. So you just have to shove a boob in his mouth and hope for the best or he'll starve. The problem is that you can take one of these new atheists and send him up a mountain of boobs, and he'll come back down still sucking his thumb. And what's the atheist response to everything I've said in this video? But David, you haven't proved to me that what you're saying is true, as if they prove anything they ever say. It's wrong to mention your religious beliefs when your son dies. Really? Can you prove that? Don't ever forget they're only skeptics when we say something. When they say something, they're the infallible cherubs of dogma. This clown skepticism of the new atheists isn't a tool for avoiding falsehood. It's a tool for avoiding realities they don't like. Richard Dawkins was asked, If God did exist, what sort of evidence could God give you that would convince you that he exists? Dawkins couldn't think of anything. He said that if God audibly spoke to him, he would dismiss it and conclude that he's hallucinating. He said that even if God wrote a message to him in the stars, he still wouldn't believe in God because the message in the stars could have been put there by powerful aliens trying to trick him. Peter Atkins agreed that if God wrote a message in the stars, he wouldn't consider it evidence for God. He went on to say that even if he died and woke up and was confronted by St. Peter at the pearly gates, he still wouldn't believe. Mike Lacona asked Matt Dillahunty about what would qualify as evidence for the supernatural. Mike said, look, if I was beheaded in front of everyone and you saw my decapitated corpse and then I came back and I walked in and I told you about my trip to heaven and I told you about someone I met there, someone who had had a private conversation with you and I knew the details of that conversation even though the person was dead, would that convince you that something supernatural had occurred? Dillahunty immediately replied, no. Atheists set up a methodology that is impervious to evidence, and then they demand evidence. It's like a flat earther saying, just so you know, I will automatically reject any evidence that the earth is round. Now, prove to me that the earth is round. For those of you who haven't gone the skeptic clown route, think about the story we went through and how deep it goes and how it connects everything to everything else. Sometimes the proof is in the profundity. Now, back to the criticisms I said I would respond to. Should we have aborted Paley because he had a 50-50 chance of having MTM? 
should we have let Reed and Paley die once it was clear that they had a muscle disease? If your only guiding moral principle here is, well, if life is going to be tough for someone, he's better off dead, you might think that offing babies is the path to paradise. But that's not my guiding moral principle and the ethical implications of that moral principle, and the questions that arise about who would get to decide who lives and who dies are pretty disturbing. But what if we ignore ungrounded ethical theories and we just focus on the lives of the children and their impact on the world? Reed had an extremely tough life. But apart from times when he was actually in pain for some reason, he was almost always happy and smiling and dancing. He didn't complain. He would occasionally get annoyed, but he definitely didn't share the pessimistic attitude toward life that consumes these enraged Twitter critics. In fact, in spite of his disability, Reed was happier than his haters seemed to be. Why is MTM on the verge of being cured? Not too long ago, no one was researching MTM, because kids who were born with it, and there weren't many of them, all died. There wasn't much of a reason to try curing a disease when no one had the disease because everyone who got it was already dead. But then, due to medical advances, the babies started surviving, and parents started fighting for their kids and convincing medical researchers to start working on MTM. This disease is going to be cured because there are kids like Reed and Paley whose parents are fighting for them. If parents didn't fight for them, parents just let them die, the disease would never be cured. So, either this generation of kids with MTM will be cured, or the next generation of kids with MTM will be cured. Either way, it's specifically because parents didn't just let their kids die that future generations won't have to die. Some kids have tough lives now so that kids in the future won't have to. What about the impact these special needs kids have on the people around them? When Reed was still really young, he started randomly pulling out his trach tube. Now, that's what he breathes through. He would look around and all of a sudden yank it out and toss it like he just didn't want it, and we'd rush to put it back in. I thought he was trying to get attention, but one day, one of my older sons, who was still pretty young too, said, maybe Reed is realizing that he's different. Maybe he's pulling out his trach because he wants to be like the rest of us. Maybe we should wear trachs when we're around Reed so that he won't feel like he's different. He meant that we should cut the ends off some trach tubes so we didn't have to actually insert them, and then wear trach collars when we were around Reed so that Reed would think it's normal. What was going on there? That was the son of a psychopath figuring out ways to help his little brother and teaching his father about showing creative compassion. Back in 2013, the Make-A-Wish Foundation sent our family on a trip to Disney World. We spent a week there. Taking two kids with MTM on a week-long trip is a lot of work. They have a ton of equipment, and when you're out all day with them, you have to bring everything they need for the entire day, plus emergency supplies in case something goes wrong. It's a lot of stuff. So, we had to tell our older kids, listen guys, this trip is mainly for Reed and Paley. They don't get to do a lot of really fun things, so this is mostly for them, and you two are going to have to spend most of your time at Disney World helping us take care of your brothers. Our older kids were still pretty young, so I was wondering if they were going to be resentful. They were in the most fun place in the world for a kid, and they had to spend most of their time there pushing their brothers around in wheelchairs or carrying supplies. Now, there were times when we said, okay, we'll stay here with Reed and Paley while you guys go on some rides, but most of the time they were helping take care of their brothers. And they never showed the slightest hint that they were at all bothered by the fact that other kids were running around playing while they were helping their brothers. They were happy making sure their little brothers were having fun. You see this sort of thing happen over and over again, and you realize that these special needs kids 
spend their entire lives making everyone around them stronger, more compassionate, less selfish. They constantly make everyone around them better people. It doesn't have to be that way. You could treat them terribly and become a worse person for it. But when you try to give them the best lives they can have, they force you to grow as a human being. I would argue that if you've spent your entire life making everyone around you better, you've lived a good life. My son Reed was always a blessing to everyone. And now, even in death, seems like he just blessed you with, let's face it, one of the greatest Christian videos ever made. I challenge you keyboard jihadis and atheists, again, I'm talking about the perpetually enraged atheist, I challenge you to have a better impact on the people around you and on the world than my son Reed had. But you won't be able to do it if all you do is sit around all day whining and insulting people on social media. What about the claim that we shouldn't bring up our religious beliefs when a son dies? A lot of atheists gave a thumbs up when someone scolded me for saying Reed went to be with Jesus. They do not want to hear anything about Jesus when someone's son dies. How did that work out for you, atheists? You should put me in a mall because I'm an escalator. My son died and I turned the sad event into an epic message of hope and transformation. I wonder where I got that idea. Oh, it's exactly what God did. Would our atheist friends prefer hopelessness and despair? Not on my watch. My son's death led to insults and mockery from keyboard jihadis. I took the insults and mockery and transformed them into a glorious victory. I wonder where I got that idea. Oh, it's exactly what God did. See why it helps to know the plot? That leaves us with the claim that I shouldn't worship God if he doesn't give my son a properly functioning body. I did my doctoral dissertation on what's regarded as the most sophisticated version of the argument from evil. It's the Bayesian argument from evil. So I have quite a few thoughts about the argument from evil. I can share those some other time if you're interested. But since this was raised specifically as a criticism against me, I'll just say here that I understand when people who are going through terrible situations in life cry out, come on, God, why is this happening? Some of the greatest heroes in the Bible complained a lot when things went horribly wrong. I get that. But at the end of the day, it's never crossed my mind to be anything but thankful for all my sons. Why would I hate and despise God when I'm filled with gratitude? Because some atheists on Twitter don't like it when I'm grateful? God gave his own son a properly functioning body, and that son offered up his body for my son. I can't bring myself to complain. Reed spent the first six months of his life in a children's hospital. All he ever saw for his first six months of his life were the walls and ceiling and equipment inside the hospital and the people who were there. He had no concept of life outside the room he was in. I was in California when Marie sent me a picture. The nurses had helped her put Reed and his equipment in a stroller so he could finally go outside. Marie rolled him out the door, and Reed looked up and saw the sky for the first time. And this little boy, who had only known the inside of a hospital, this little boy, who had been poked and prodded and cut by doctors and nurses, was in total awe as he discovered that reality was much bigger and far more amazing than everything he had experienced in his room at the children's hospital. If this was his expression when he saw the sky, what do you think he looked like when he finally saw the face of the Almighty who made the sky? What are you going to look like when you see him?